Well, everybody, welcome to the Dharma Toolkit with Mithy Maximilian. And I will let you take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Alexis. Yes, so we're on um, the uh, second last uh, session. This one's on Sangha etiquette. Uh, so how to fulfill our refuge commitment um, by respecting the Sangha. Uh, who the Sangha are, what the, the benefits, how we can support the Sangha, what to do if we run into difficulties, uh, and then also kind of segueing a little bit over to how to actually listen at teachings, especially how to listen to Rinpoche or how to listen to Getty's at teachings. So hopefully we'll get through this whole gamut of, um, of all things Sangha and teachings and, uh, and devotion in just a few short minutes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, because Sangha etiquette is, um, is something that uh, we don't really pay any attention to until we trip over it, until something goes wrong or until uh, we embarrass ourselves. So it's worth just um, having a, a, a preliminary look at it. And also we can relax because most of it is common sense, which is, which is great. Uh, we can be um, what I like to term uh, informal, but not casual. So we can be relaxed and really respectful at the same time. So let's just um, adjust our motivation as we normally do at the beginning of each of these classes. So the two wings of the bird, the wisdom and the compassion. Uh, so on the wisdom side of things with a sense of curiosity and uh, really a joy in learning new things, discovering things that we've missed out, but with a, an intention to develop our wisdom to its ultimate uh, so that we can become fully enlightened for the benefit of everybody. The compassion side of things, we need to be able to develop our good heart, all of our skills, our ways of communicating, our ways of being in the world and supporting our Dharma brothers and sisters, um, not just for our day-to-day -day survival and our um, you know, nice kind of lifestyle at the moment, but really so that everything that we do puts in place conducive conditions that from now all the way to enlightenment in the future, um, we have the support of Dharma brothers and sisters, we have Sangha, we have teachers. Um, because we need this, this incredible network of, of, um, of Dharma brothers and sisters of all sorts and of, of spiritual friends, our wonderful guides, to be able to achieve our goal, which is enlightenment for the sake of every single sentient being. <laughs> so the wonderful thing about setting a motivation is we can always adjust our motivation, isn't it? So... Um, Let's start off with looking at who actually are the Sangha. Because we're talking about Sangha etiquette, but who are the Sangha? So this is a wonderful image of, of the, the first Sangha, the, the first five disciples, when just after the Buddha became enlightened. And there are different levels of Sangha, and it's important that we uh, don't get them mixed up. So the Arya Sangha are the actual Sangha jewel, who we take refuge in. An individual Arya is someone who has true, true paths and true cessations in their mind stream. So they've, they've, they have a direct perception of emptiness. Uh, they're called non-returners. So, so they are the actual Sangha jewel, the Aryas. And then we have their representatives, which are the monks and the nuns. So the monastic order, the, the fully ordained ones, and they represent the Sangha jewel, but they're not the actual Sangha jewel. In the perfection vehicle, you need to have a group of four or more fully ordained monks or nuns for it to be counted as Sangha. And so you think of them as holders of the Buddha's vow. Then also in the West, we've kind of fallen into this thing where we think our spiritual peer group, like, like, like you and me, all of us here, we're Sangha, meaning just a, a community of 
Dharma aspirants, I suppose. But actually, His Holiness the Dalai Lama says it's best, better not to say that lay people are Sangha because we're not monastics and it's a little confusing. So we are our spiritual peer group, our Dharma brothers and sisters, but we're not actually Sangha, we're lay people. And um, of course, then the inner Sangha, the resultant uh, Sangha jewel is the qualities that develop in our own mind, um, the, the inner company that we keep. So that's, that's the Sangha that we're aspiring to, the resultant Sangha. So there's a little quote from His Holiness, uh, the Dalai Lama, and he says, uh, although realized beings may be members of religious institutions, these institutions are offer, often operated by ordinary beings. Our refuge must always remain purely with the three jewels. If it does, we will not be confused by the actions of ordinary beings. Because it's important to remember that not all Buddhists are Buddhas. <laughs> So it's just a nice way of saying that the, the monks and nuns, the ordained sangha, are human beings. And we've got to remember that. We've got to put things into context. So, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, the Buddha um, formed the sangha community of monks and nuns. And uh, part of our kind of, um, I suppose, challenge is, as Westerners, even to figure out, well, who is a monk or a nun? How do we distinguish between monastics and laypersons? So, for instance, you, you might think, oh, if they've got robes, but actually that's not so true because some of the robes are where laypersons, householders, just wear very simple clothing, but they're not actually um, living in um, the ordained monastic vows of celibacy, for instance. So I've put up here this fantastic book, Following in the, in the Buddha's Footsteps by um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Thupten Chodron. This whole series of books is so spectacular. And if you're going to take anything to a desert island, this is the series of books to take with you. Um, so here's His Holiness and um, Tupton Trojan, Venerable Tupton Trojan there uh, at the launch of the book. And there's a whole chapter in here about the Sangha that is uh, really clear, really easy to read, lots of useful information. In this second picture, we have His Holiness Sakyatrizen, who's there wearing the white uh, skirt, part of the robe, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and an attendant. So the, um, the, the Tibetans wear the maroon robes, and then at teachings, they wear these saffron-coloured robes, and then at the Theravada tradition, they wear the saffron robes. So this is the monastic robes. And you can tell here by the undershirt that this is with the, the yellow and the maroon, that it is a, a Geshe degree. When it's just all maroon, then it's like um, the monks or the nuns. His Holiness Sakya Trizen, though, the Sakya tradition is a family tradition. So they get married and they have children. So they're not monks or nuns. And so His Holiness uh, asked, asked them to wear white coloured um, lower garment to so that we can distinguish between this otherwise it can get quite confusing and also his holiness Saki Trizen has long hair so of course when you're a monk or a nun then you shave your head you don't have any hair so there are these distinctions and um, if in doubt uh, ask somebody um, who knows it can sometimes also be confusing, for instance, where at a Dharma center, you might have monks and nuns there, but then if they're doing building work or they're going to the shop, sometimes they don't wear their robes. And then you just think, well, are they a monk or a nun or not? And so again, His Holiness asked everybody to always wear their robes, even if they're doing hard physical labor, um, just in the interest of clarity. If you're a monastic, if you're a monk or a nun, then you're necessarily celibate, no exceptions. If um, there are great practitioners, great meditators who have uh, taken a consort, a tantric consort, 
but they give up their vows first. They give up their monastic vows. They become a lay person. They leave the monastery. So um, I know in the West there's a bit of, been a bit of ambiguity about that, but but pretty much uh, there shouldn't be. <laughs> Just like across the world, monastics live um, a renounced life, poverty, chastity. You know, it's it's pretty across the board. Then I have this wonderful quote from Lama Zoprimbache about the Sangha, especially uh, in the West. Sangha are the real heroes uh, by defeating the delusions. A hero is not what the government or the outside world considers a hero, such as those depicted in statues who've killed many people. Sangha are the real heroes and heroines. You took this incredible opportunity to be a hero over all the delusions to defeat, control and cease the oceans of suffering of each realm. If that isn't a hero, then what is? <laughs> isn't that just the most spectacular quote? So we have real heroes in our midst and, and I just so wish that we had uh, great, wonderful monuments and, and, and statues in all the parks to, uh, to Sherry Putra and, um, and all the various <laughs> amazing monks and nuns throughout the centuries. So, so the Sangha, the monks and nuns have been charged with preserving the Buddha's teachings throughout the ages. And so they hold the transmitted teachings and, um, and, and study and make sure that the lineage is clear and they also uphold the realizations. So they live with the wisdom. So it's the two things, you know, there's the scriptural learning, but there's also upholding the realizations and the good heart. And then when the Sangha live in a monastic community, that's really inspiring for us Westerners because, you know, it's not the consumerist culture. It's, it's renouncing that hyper materialism that we have in our world. So it can be really inspiring to us that there are people living like that. Now, uh, how we can best respect the Sangha or how we can just feel comfortable with the Sangha. I'm not sure if you have monks or nuns in your centre or not, uh, or uh, even in your town. We've got on, on our side of Brisbane uh, quite a few nuns uh, living on in this area, and so they're often seen at the local supermarket, which is wonderful. And one of the most common things that they're asked is, oh, good day, how are you going? How's the Dalai Lama? <laughs> As you're going up the escalators to go shopping. So um, there's some really nice rule of thumb ways that we can respect the Sangha, the do's and don'ts. You might think some of these are really obvious, but not necessarily. <laughs> so how to do it? Always respect them as holders of the Buddha's vow. This is what, what we've got to remember, that they are, they are holding the Buddha's vow and that is spectacular. Um, there's no goodness exam to become a monk or a nun. Um, it's just whether you have the merit to and whether it's going to turn out well or not. It may be the only good thing going on in your life is that you are a holder of the Buddha's vow and everything else may have just you know, gone pear-shaped. So the criteria isn't whether you're a good enough person. The criteria is whether it's going to benefit for you um, to be a vow holder. So some monks and nuns are really together and others are really messy. Doesn't matter. We respect them as holders of the Buddha's vow. And so how do we show that respect? So always letting them go first. Um, letting them enter the gompa first, letting them all sit at the front. Uh, even if they go, oh, no, 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 that's okay, I'll sit at the back, ushering them to the front, offering them a seat. To uh, encourage the sangha to sit and eat together if they're having an offered lunch, um, this is one of the wishes of Lama Yeshi, so that they themselves get to feel that they uh, have a, a Dharma community. So it's not that they're snubbing us Westerners, it's just to help, especially the Western Sangha, experience this feeling of community, which could be quite rare if you're living in a city. 
try and offer uh, money on holy days. So at pujas on the four great holy days of the year where the merit is multiplied, um, don't offer nude money, put it in a little red envelope or wrap it up in an envelope or something. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. Um, so at each puja here, we uh, we just make like a little $5 offering in each of the red envelopes to, to whatever sangha come along, um, just as a way of showing respect and kind of fulfilling our, our refuge vows of that. With our speech, always call them venerable. Venerable last sum, venerable alsa, venerable setan. The benefit of this is that if you can't quite get your tongue around the Tibetan word of what their name is, hey, venerable, <laughs> will do. And if they say, oh, no, 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 you don't have to call me that, just ignore it <laughs> because, and if they insist, and I I, um, <laughs> I had not quite a stand-up argument, but I had a very vigorous conversation um, with venerable Gatso, Adrian Feldman, uh, down in Victoria about this because he's like no no don't call me venerable and in the end I had to say look venerable it's not about you it's about me <laughs> I need to show respect so get over it and he's like oh okay <laughs> so there's some things you really have to insist on like that so call them venerable even just in when I refer to them in conversation I try and practice that kind of mindfulness and um Offer when you offer them things, presents, try and make them appropriate presents. So things that are consumables are really good. So fruit or food, food vouchers, tea, coffee, uh, nice soap that doesn't have lots of smell but you know isn't all chemically, socks, brown socks, petrol vouchers. All of those kind of things are really nice to offer. And um, you can offer them also health appointments. So um, book, book in a remedial massage or book in a, a, a health check or this or that. But um, what not to do, for instance, is um, don't invite them to watch movies with heaps of sex and violence in them. <laughs> so nice kids movies. One of the favourite movies of all time for many of the llamas is an Australian movie called Babe, um, you know, about the, the, the talking little piglet. I mean, they just love it because the animals talk for, for starters. So that's just really nice. Um, or happy feet, you know, with the penguins, things like that. Don't invite them out to a nightclub or a casino or even to have a shopping, you know, entertainment experience at the shopping centre. Uh, better to invite them to a lovely nature walk or a Buddhist exhibition or to a, a fellow visiting um, Dharma centre down the road or something like that. Don't kiss and cuddle in front of them. <laughs> Now, you might think this is a no-brainer, but I've seen uh, many times in, in the, uh, courses where uh, people have been doing a meditation course together for, you know, a month or so, and occasionally romance blossoms. I mean, it's kind of sad, isn't it? But it, but it happens because your heart opens and you kind of haven't got too strong a refuge. So you take refuge in a, in a person. And then you get all lovey-dovey and feel all nice and warm and then just, you know, Smooch and canoodle in the gompa, not done. <laughs> so we're in the presence of renunciates. And so we ourselves have to act chaste to be able to um, support them. Don't drink and do drugs in their presence. Um, well, that, that should be a bit of a no-brainer. But, but here's one that we don't often know. Don't hug them or even shake hands because there's supposed to be no physical contact. And um, if you're a very huggy person, uh, you can get caught out with this. And also many of the monks and nuns might have been very huggy people. And if someone close to you becomes ordained, you might spontaneously go give them a great big hug to congratulate them. But actually that's kind of like a, a downfall of the vows. So what you do is you take your cues from them. 
Many llamas, when you first meet them, they'll just stick out their hand and heartily shake your hand. That's fine, but you, you take your cue. Some monks and nuns are very strict with this, and if you even stand too close, they will stand back, and you'll kind of feel like, oh, there's too much distance. Now in COVID, it's actually really good. <laughs> We've got to have our social distancing. When you make offerings, don't offer you know, big, expensive luxury items, just good quality, simple items. And with our speech, try not to contradict, your, contradict them in public. So even if there is um, something, you know, that they've, that they've said, maybe the Dharma information is not right, rather than go, oh, that's wrong, um, ask a question about it. Oh, I, I was under the impression it was this, and maybe it's that. Can you explain? So do it very respectfully like that. So as to not to cause others to lose their, um, their devotion or their refuge. Oh, Kidoki. So before we go on any further, any questions? <laughs> Ian's wondering where to buy socks. Well, I used to buy maroon socks, but apparently uh, brown socks is better and brown is easier to buy. When you find them, snap them up because they're quite rare. <laughs> what else? Any other questions that people have? Yes, Mary. Niffy, thank you for this teaching. This is fabulous. Um, I have two questions. Um, I loved when you talked about the colors, um, but I also noticed like my medicine blue wall. Sometimes I see that piping on the side, like of the maroon robe. Yep. Yes, so the blue piping on the edge um, comes from uh, Mongolia and um, it's when the, the ordained lineage almost, uh, um, almost ran out in Tibet and so they had to get a couple of Sangha from Mongolia and that way the lineage didn't die out but it was sustained. So as a, as a thank you and a reminder of that, then they put the blue on the edge. Okay, and my second question is, if I'm writing the word venerable, I sometimes have seen it abbreviated V-E-N with the period and other yeah. times V-E-N without a period. So which is correct? Um, in terms of the English language, V-E-N dot. <laughs> but either that or venerable. But, um, but that's also a cultural thing because in other traditions, um, like in the, the um, Taiwanese Buddhist tradition, they call everyone reverend. And uh, in some of the Tibetan traditions, they call the, the nuns anila, for instance. But that's a little, it's, a, it's like auntie, which could be uh, a little disrespectful. So uh, we just go, it's just a, a colloquial thing with venerable. Um, as long as you use some form of honorific. So if it's a teacher, then it's gen uh, or geshila. <laughs> Uh, but it's good to practice uh, this kind of respect with our speech. Yeah, Fran. Um, so you talked about sort of there's no touching, no physical contact because it may break their vows. So giving them a massage voucher wouldn't be the best thing then, would it? No, no, we can give them a massage voucher because then they go to a professional and that's fine and the professional isn't devoted to them. They're not an object of refuge for the professional, but we ourselves shouldn't offer a massage because we can't keep it clean like that. It doesn't quite make sense to me that. There's so the, um, the, the vow, remember, it's about, um, so, you know, getting a massage or even going to a hospital, that's about health. So, of course, mm. you need it. That's, that's not breaking the vow of physical contact contact but when it's um when it's a student offering a massage um as mm. an act of devotion then it can get very muddy the waters so it's much better to make that offering and have a professional do it <laughs> you still get the merit okay. but there's no discomfort on either side yeah so yeah. good point okie dokie so General do's and don'ts. Now, <laughs> what things can we request to the Sangha? 
So this wonderful image, this is the Geshe Saltram from um, Chen Resik Institute and uh, four newly ordained nuns. Uh, a quote from the Buddha, wherever there is a monk or nun observing the Vinaya, that place is luminous and radiant. I see that place as not empty and I myself abide there peacefully. And what better to illustrate that quote than this photograph here? So traditionally, the, the Sangha are supported by the lay community for all of their, their physical worldly needs. And in return, the Sangha support the lay community with all their spiritual needs. So it's this really nice balance. And often when things get out of whack or when problems happen, it's because that balance hasn't been kind of observed. There are, there are appropriate things that we ask the Sangha to do. Um, and, and some things it's really good to avoid. So things like uh, various blessings, baby blessings, house blessings, animal blessings, uh, that kind of thing is very nice to ask the Sangha to do to um, officiate at funerals, at weddings, not so much, because when you think about it, a sangha are renunciates, so they can't really bestow a marriage vow. And actually, Lama Yeshi um, asked the monks and nuns not to be the marriage celebrant, not to bestow the marriage vow, but what they can do is bless the union. So somebody else marries them, but the sangha can then... Um, you know, charge both the, 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 the husband and wife to be kind to each other, to support each other, to work for the benefit of sentient beings, that kind of thing. And, of course, we ask the Sangha to lead pujas, to lead meditation, to recite sutras for us, uh, to give teachings at whatever level that they can, even if it's just leading Shakyamuni Buddha meditation to visit the sick and the ailing, to give solace and refuge to others. Uh, and you can ask them for um, Dharma advice, but not for counselling. So this is something to, that's quite tricky for us Westerners, um, that often we will ask monks and nuns or the lamas for advice like what school do I send my kid to or what do I do with this relationship problem or should I get married <laughs> and like these are not dharma questions if you can phrase them in from a dharma point of view then yes but otherwise um, worldly questions like that not appropriate to ask um, and also to expect a monk or a nun to be a counsellor like a psychological counsellor for us also it's not right um, they can't give that kind of advice. The, what they can share is the Buddha's teachings uh, and maybe their own experience. So it's up to us to, um, to kind of be mindful of that. Talking from experience, like I have asked the wildestly inappropriate questions of the lamas throughout my time from growing up, you know, uh, in, in a Buddhist household, like, the things that I asked when I was a teenager, I hang my head in shame. But you know, the llamas, they're so um this they're, they're so kind and accommodating and they just walked me through the problems. And and luckily I, I listened to most of it. So <laughs> if you do ask the monks or nuns to to come and bless your house or to, you know, offer a, a, a offered lunch or to read a sutra in your garden or something like that, try and um Make them an offering, uh, a, a dharma offering, like offer some money or some fruit or some of those consumables, and then separately offer some money for transport to pay their transport costs. Because many monks and nuns will separate out those two offerings. If it's dharma money, they just put it back into dharma things, going to teachings or buying dharma books. So it's good if you separate it out and put something else, say, in a white envelope and go, oh, and this is for your petrol or give them a petrol voucher or something like that. Okay. So traditionally in, in a Buddhist society, the lay people would provide the four requisites for sangha, robes, food, lodging, and medicine. 
So in a in a Buddhist society, this is really crucial because uh, the the sangha don't go out and work. They don't handle money. They they live from alms, from donations, from the community, and they try and live together as a monastic community and support each other. Have dharma friends. In the West, this is quite different. Um, you know, in Australia, we have universal health care. We have um, a, a social security, a safety net. There is pensions. Um, there are lots of kind of support like that. You don't have to be in poverty in Australia. So supplying those kinds of things isn't necessarily what we have to do in the West. Um, and also, you know, people don't necessarily have the amount of money to be able to sustain a lifestyle a Western lifestyle with like the huge expenses that come. So generally in the West, if you become ordained, you have to be able to support yourself financially. It's not like there's this great, fantastic, um, you know, Catholic church behind with all of this incredible wealth that can give you a stipend. Uh, if, if you're lucky after you've been ordained for quite a long time, then you might get a stipend to do retreat. But really you have to be able to support yourself um, and to not expect that, uh, you will be supported by getting money from Dharma teachings, for instance, because that way it's a real slippery slope. Also, there's a quote from his, um, that, that wonderful book, Following in the Buddha's Footsteps. Uh, For those holding monastic ordination, a big trap lies in receiving material gifts and social respect. So avoid attachment to such things. Those that are free from materialistic grasping are a source of delight to the wise, like a lotus blossoming in fire. So that's kind of the, the approach that the monks and nuns try and, and, uh, and develop. And so how this plays out is that if you're uh, in a monastery or a Dharma centre, you try and have that, that monastery, the, the institution itself, um, really rich and beautiful and inspiring, a beautiful gompa, a wonderful library, lots of holy objects, the repository of all the Buddhist teachings there, you know, the, the scriptural teachings. Um, but the individuals themselves um, living quite a, a simple lifestyle, um, turning their backs on things that cause grasping. So it's this really nice balance. It doesn't mean that you have to be bereft of all the beauty and everything, but that's more held in common. As individuals, the monks and nuns live a very um, simple lifestyle. And we can honour our refuge commitments by contributing to those four requisites in, in the way that we can. Um, a little bit later on, I've got a, a list of how we do that uh, just here in the West, which is a little bit different from um, in, in Eastern Buddhist countries. So we have our four requisites. Now, what happens, though, uh, if things go wrong? Because... Things do go wrong, don't they? I mean, they go wrong in our life and they also go wrong for the monks and nuns. And um, in, in a way, because our society is so materialistic and there's hardly any space for monks and nuns, it's not a culturally accepted thing. Um, it's very challenging to be ordained in the West. So often when things go wrong, abuse happens. So abuse happens generally when, when the teacher prioritises their own needs over those of the student. That's, that's how it happens. So if you think about that, it's very easy to happen, isn't it? You know, we might start off with an altruistic motivation and within 10 minutes it's degenerated into what about me and my needs? You know, we've forgotten all about the others. So this happens even easier with monks and nuns because people, um, lay people have such generally such respect for the robes that when something does go wrong, if a Sangha member 
act poorly, we experience cognitive dissonance, which means we can't quite grasp what's happened. Uh, we have like a brain freeze and kind of ignore it or whitewash it or justify it or pretend it didn't happen or are so shocked that we don't even know what to do. And by deferring to the robes, we actually condone that negative behaviour. So in that way, we do a real disservice to the Sangha and to ourselves. So how does a situation like this come about? In the West, it's because who actually holds the Sangha accountable? If, if you're not living in a monastery with an abbot, with a gaygu, a disciplinarian, with the monastic community and all of the hierarchy, if you're just a monk or a nun living in a city, visiting a Dharma centre or, or living in a Dharma centre and going out to work, your abbot may be on the other side of the road, uh, other side of the world. Um, all of your discipline must come from yourself, from within. And that's a really big ask, isn't it? Um, we rely on a, on a witness, on a watcher, on feedback from others to tell if we're getting a bit out of hand or not. And when you become ordained and everyone shows so much respect, you've got no way of knowing if you're just losing the plot. You've got no way of knowing if, you're, um, if your behaviour is degenerating because you don't get any feedback. You don't get any feedback because us lay people have brain freeze <laughs> and we don't know what to do about it. So um, me and Eddie do, kind of developed a response matrix of what we, how we can actually respond when things go wrong. Before I share that with you, I wanted to read a quote from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, again from that book, Following in the Buddha's Footsteps, of how to regard a monastic who's transgressed their precepts. Without disrespecting the person, we think that the robes are the robes of the fully awakened Buddha, who is free from all pollutants and has complete ethical conduct, concentration, wisdom and liberation. As such, we have respect for Aryas and we generate compassion for the monastic. Without whitewashing the situation, we recognise this person's conduct is not appropriate, although they wear the Buddha's robes. But since the Buddha advised us not to despise the unlearned, we recall that it's the person's afflictions that have committed the offence. Since this person has access to the Buddha's teachings, if they study and practice them in the future, they will come to know, confess and rectify their lapses. And in this case, they will still be able to become an Arya and a Buddha one day. So in a nutshell, it's like respect the robes, even if the person is struggling. And how we show respect isn't just by being nice, but it's actually by having it as a practice and supporting the Sangha and finding a way to um, respectfully give feedback. So that's why I put respect up here, because um, whether you're Sangha or whether you're a class leader at a meditation center, any kind of abuse happens when, when we lose our motivation and when we prioritize our own needs over those of the student. It's like a Pandora's box. It opens the door to all the problems. Um, if we actually prioritize the students first, there's no way we're going to get into trouble. <laughs> so the other thing then is to to guard against our own double standards. You know, as lay people, we ourselves have to become incorruptible. So our namesake here at Lungri Tumpa Center, Geshe Lungri Tumpa, with his eight verses of um, thought transformation, one of those verses, I will always put myself the lowest of all and hold others dear and supreme. If we have uh, this attitude, it means we become incorruptible. There's no way that we can become haughty by receiving lots of gifts. There's no way that we'll start thinking that we're better than others because everyone shows us respect and we must be special. 
There's no way that we will st- will disregard others through pride, through just indifference, because we're holding them more dear than ourselves. That verse is the way to stop all corruption. <laughs> and there are a couple of politicians in the world that live by that verse. There was um, a guy in um, one of the presidents in one of the South American countries, you know, drives a little old beat up car and everything, gives half of his salary away to the poor. He has that attitude and he is incorruptible. <laughs> so, so for starters, that's what we should act like and then encourage others to act like that too. And, of course, the Sangha have to take that as well. But we as lay people, we have to set the standard. It's very overwhelming being new Sangha in the West. And, and our job as lay people is to have refuge in the, the Sangha jewel and to support those representatives so that we create the causes for Sangha in the future. Uh, So before I go on to the response matrix, are there any questions yet? Questions, comments, anything at all, anything to share? (laughs) Yes, Alexis. How do you, uh, if you you are talking to uh, like, like Geshela on the phone, how would I um, how would how would I offer something to him? Um, Is there a way you set up so you can send them money or? Yes, yeah, so I don't if know it's how just you would do that. a general conversation, like you know, day to day organizing stuff, then um, then just being really respectful with with your speech. If you are requesting something, like an initiation or a teaching, then then you have to make an offering too so that you create the merit for it to turn out. Whether that is deposit something into their bank account beforehand, even make a donation on their behalf to their monastery, um, something for us to put fuel in the tank merit-wise, really important. Thank you. Actually, um, Lama Zoprimbache often talks about how when he first uh, met Lama Yeshi, he he came kind of empty-handed. He didn't have anything good to offer, um, to offer a mandala. And because of that, then that's why the FPMT has been so poor over the decades. (laughs) That's what Rinpoche says. Uh, I mean, of course, there's no way that he's, you know, that's our group karma. That's no fault from Rinpoche's side, um, that's our group karma. Uh, You know, it has its pluses and minuses. I mean, the fact that we're relatively a poor organisation is good because it keeps us honest. You know, if we had all this wealth coming in and whatever, who knows, we might have been completely corrupted by now. So, uh, you know, keeps us honest. (laughs) So when things go wrong... We have to set the standard. There's, there's just a, a saying, isn't it, that the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. So we can't abdicate the responsibility to others. We, we ourselves have to have some responsibility here. So the responses matrix of when things go wrong, we've got to deal with each of these three levels in order. We've got the worldly, the sutra, and the tantra. And um, just before we go there, uh, we've got to go in this order because each one supports the next one. It's like our Dharma studies. Sutra supports tantra. (laughs) You know, the teachings in common with the lower vehicle, the middle vehicle, the higher vehicle. It's not that we ditch the lower vehicle teachings when we get up to the high vehicle. Each one supports the next one, that we have them all together. So the same approach. When we have difficulties, uh, we've got to have we've got to go in this particular order, like Russian dolls, you know, one inside the other, and, and not ditch the worldly level for the sake of the sutra level or the tantra level. Each one supports the next one. And so I think 
where we've gone, uh, got into difficulty in Dharma centers is that we've forgotten this. We haven't actually integrated this Dharma approach because the Dharma approach also has the worldly approach. It starts off with that. So from the worldly point of view, when we have a grievance, for instance, um, if there's if you've been in a committee meeting and you have a monk or a nun on the committee and they get really angry and they yell and abuse people, this can be incredibly disconcerting. <laughs> uh, so, so what do you do? The very first thing is that, that to be a professional, we have professionalism. Just in the world, we have professionalism. We've got to protect ourselves and others from abuse and we have to also protect the abuser. So centres have grievance procedures. They have a, a system of who do you speak to first? How do you, how do you speak to the person? Just, just to do with the volunteers. We've got policies and procedures, but many centres don't even know what they are. But they're our, they're our life rafts. They're so important. So what we can do at the meeting is remind everybody in general. So I'd just like to remind everybody that we have a code of conduct at this centre. Um, we, we have policies and procedures for meetings. Uh, and... Um, and I would like to request the Sangha member to um, help us in implementing kind speech. So, you know, it puts them on the spot. It's respectful. Uh, it kind of uses that public forum to force them into like becoming their best self. And remember, we have the laws of the land. So we have workplace health and safety. We have protecting um, from abuse and non-discrimination and no bullying in the work for, in the workplace, all of those things. That's the laws of our, of our country. We have to abide by them. So that's the very minimum in any place. And, um, and a Dharma center should be exemplary in this, not the worst, the best. So once we've got the worldly thing sorted, with no double standard, <laughs> then we start looking from the sutra point of view. As a Buddhist, as a Buddhist, what does this experience mean for me? So one, we recalibrate our refuge and we go, oh, I, actually, the, my real refuge is the Arya Sangha. And here is a struggling human being who is a representative of the Sangha. And, you know, they've taken, they're the hero. They've taken those vows and I haven't had the guts to take the vows. So that's pretty amazing. And now they're being ruled by their delusions and you know, exhibiting poor behaviour. So we remember we put our refuge into context. Whatever difficulty happens, we think of it. We have now paid a karmic debt. We've been yelled at by a monk or a nun. I have paid a karmic debt. In the past, I must have really disrespected and disparaged the sangha belittled them or humiliated them in front of others, been all haughty and rich and whatever, and now it comes back at me. So my karmic debt is paid. We ourselves have to keep our vows, keep ourselves nice, as the Australians say, keep yourself nice, which means no tit for tat. Don't yell back. No, no, no. We've got to have even better uh, right speech even kinder speech. We have to be respectful even if they aren't, no matter what. And uh, to not waste the problem. <laughs> so this means to stop thinking about the problem as the problem. Actually, this is now, this is now where our Dharma practice, the rubber hits the road. Now we, now we get to actually do some practice and put everything that we've learned into practice right now live in the middle of this meeting, which may or may not be possible, but at the very least what we can fall back on is our own good behaviour and keeping our own vows. But in our mind, we've got to turn it around from thinking this is bad to this is good. So, yeah, it's unpleasant but it's good. Why? Because there's so much I can learn from this. And don't we learn from the difficulty, difficult things? Not so much the easy things. 
So don't waste all of that pain and suffering. You know, we can really um, benefit from it. We can profit from this experience. The other thing that a difficult situation does is it shows us, it's like a mirror, isn't it? It shows us exactly where's my self-cherishing? Where's my strong sense of I? Um, how much does my sense of self-worth depend on how others reflect back to me? All of those things, it's a wake-up call for us. And it, it's an opportunity for us to start building a really strong Sangha community to put in place as the cause that put in place the cause for future strong Sangha community. So right then, that's when we stop our normal retaliation response and we harness it to make the Sangha even stronger. It's a big ask, but if you do it, it can be very, uh, very powerful. Uh, then the next level, the tantric level, we can take it even further. We can take this disastrous situation even further. Whenever we have, especially in a Dharma context, something really horrible happened to us, it's a wrathful teaching. So when unpleasant things happen to us, we think because it feels bad, it is bad. That's not true. That's called cognitive fusion. It feels bad. It's unpleasant but it can be good. And what that means is instead of having a nice, peaceful, blissful teaching, we've had a wrathful teaching. We've had a wake-up call. It's unpleasant, but it's unforgettable. There's something that we learn here that, that becomes, we can develop a very deep realisation. In fact, whenever difficulties arise, we can think of it as the protectors tapping us on the shoulder, reminding us, nah, you kind of, um, you're falling off your refuge. You're falling into the eight worldly concerns here. We've strayed off the path, the Dharma path, into the worldly path. So it's a, it's a reminder. And that we suffer because it's our own negative karmic vision. So this doesn't say that a, uh, a, a bad situation is it's not happening. It's not whitewashing it. It's not being in denial. Yeah, there's an inappropriate situation happening and it's distressing. But our suffering is our karma. The suffering part is due to me. And that's something I can do something about. <laughs> It's um, my negative karma that makes me suffer. And we can actually do something quite profound about this situation. Uh, so now, questions, comments? Does this matrix help in any way? <laughs> yeah, Francesca. Yeah, actually, I was really pleased to see in the um, Langry Tank for newsletter a couple of weeks ago about policies and processes for you know, behaviour towards monks and nuns and not being compromised and that because I don't think these things are actually uh, that formalised, you know. So it was a really No, nice they thing haven't been. See. They haven't been that formalised. Um, and uh, just recently the FPMT uh, has, has come out with a protecting from abuse policy, which is just fantastic. And it's, and it's, Put this all down in writing. So we've been a little bit slow as an organisation in, in getting it together to the forefront, but we have for years had protecting the vulnerable and um, an equal opportunity and all of those general policies um, in place. But what's so powerful is this way we can work it into our Dharma practice as well. It become can become a lot more than just a worldly policy. Um, I mean, what, what I find, like in my own experience, you can be quite dismayed at um, how sometimes in a room the most poorly behaved are the Sangha members. You know, this, this can really shake your refuge if you haven't got it clear what your refuge is. And um, it's because of this challenge of, of, of in the West um, us 
not knowing what to do as lay practitioners, how to really support uh, the Sangha and how to do that is just like with everybody to support everybody to, to behave well and not have this double standard of, of somehow the Sangha because they're in a position of authority uh, don't have to act like that or we don't have to call them out on their behaviour um, where we do say with the lay people. And then how do we do that? We've got to do that with professionalism. And just like Lama Zoprimache says, we, we have to actually become an inner professional. So this is how to do it. This is how we can actually start doing that, integrating our whole Dharma experience right there into our life. So I've had experiences of this with um, being yelled at and abused by Sangha members. And it's like, it's really confronting. And at the very least, like I've just like had my own brain freeze, but I haven't retaliated. And then I've gone back home and I've spent weeks thinking about it. What happened? What happened? What happened? And that's immeasurably beneficial for me because what's come out of it is this real commitment to supporting the Sangha. And it just wouldn't have happened otherwise. Thank you. Okey So, um, oh, here's another question. So, um, yes, yeah, so Sanghas who, um, who, who disrobe, who return their vows, um, often it's because uh, they've fallen in love with somebody. You know, as Venerable Rabina says, it's always desire. Desire is always the, re the reason why Sangha give up their vows. And pretty much that's exactly what happens. And it's what happens because in the West, um, it's so rare to live in a monastic community. You're living out in a lay community with lay people and it's very, very difficult to keep your head above water. Um, so then, uh, so that's one of the, you know, the, the, a lot of disrobing happens in the West. People give up their vows because it's, it is so challenging to keep them. But at least they've, you know, I mean, they've had the highlight of their life. That's over now. But at least that, at least they've done that in their life. When it comes to tantric practitioners, so there is a, um, a, a stage in tantric practice, in completion stage, at the end of completion stage, where you are supposed to take a consort and have a, um, a physical sexual experience um, that causes all of the winds to enter and abide in the central channel. So it's not a, a, a normal sexual experience by any means. And it's not over and over having rampant sex. It's just like a one-off thing, really. And it's to be able to actually um, harness all of those subtle energies in tantric practice to become fully enlightened. Um, so if you are up to that level of practice, then you give up your vows, you disrobe, you become a lay person and you, you, you take a, um, a wisdom mother or a wisdom father for that, you know, one event. Um, there's no way that a monk or a nun could do that. You have to give up your vows. If you don't give up your vows and you go and have sex with someone, you've broken your vows, just like you've broken a plate. <laughs> it's done. It's finished. That vow is over. You're no longer ordained. There's no ambiguity about that. Um, so, for instance, Lama Tsongkhapa, the founder of this lineage, he, he was an you know, incredibly highly experienced tantric practitioner and he um, decided not to take a, uh, a, an actual physical consort, a wisdom mother, in, in his lifetime. He took an imagined consort. He did the whole process in meditation as a celibate monk to demonstrate how important it is to be able to hold your monastic vows. There have been other great practitioners in monasteries um, that have um, done these practices and they have been, even though they're great bodhisattvas, they have been expelled from the monastery because on a worldly level, there's no double standard here. You either have the vows or you don't have the vows. Um, either way, it's completely different from ordinary sex. Don't ever think it's ordinary sex. <laughs> It's all about actually harnessing that, that chi, the inner, the inner energy, the winds, um, to cause the clear light to dawn 
and then to meditate on um, the wisdom realizing emptiness. It's the sole purpose. Okay, so whoa, we're going to run out of time soon. Uh, so you can get into lots of troubles and um, there are many stories of um, monks and nuns um, breaking their vows or having affairs or all sorts of things. Um, don't somehow think, oh, that's okay or it must be different for them or something. No, no ambiguity there at all. But how we deal with that should be in this order. First, the worldly, abide by the laws of the land, <laughs> then the sutra, and then the, the tantric point of view. And the tantric point of view does not discount the worldly point of view. They all happen simultaneously. And then we won't get into trouble. So there is a, um, a worksheet that I've included in the student materials, a very complex matrix that you can fill in there's one example of it filled in and one not filled in, um, but this is the simple version. Now, how do we support our Western Sangha in context of all of this? So we have the IMI, the International Mahayana Institute. This is their logo here, uh, set up by Lami Eshi to support the Western monks and nuns. Because you might think being a monk or a nun in the West is all, you know, just smelling the roses and being contemplative and whatever. But actually, it's a whirlwind of study and people stopping you in the street and asking you questions and visiting the sick and endless email questions and battling with technology and family duties still because, you know, you had a family beforehand. All of these things, there's hardly any time. Your life is no longer your own. It belongs to others. And this can be a real hard awakening <laughs> for many sangha. So what can we do? We can show our respect by making um, a money offering on holy days at pujas, you know, the little red envelope um, to, to actually create some merit from our side. Um, at Lungry Tumba Centre, we have a sangha fund as a safety net. So we have some money that people put in that like if they need new tyres on their car or they have, um, have to have an emergency operation or you know, medical expenses, that there is a safety net there. Try and If you have a centre that employs people that pays wages, try and employ the sangha so that, you know, because they have to support themselves, at least they have a dharma job. It's so much easier than... Than, than if they work at a plumber's with all of the girly calendars on the wall or whatever, you know, um, to, to have your income coming and actually um, offering a wage to the Sangha, uh, it's a really great way to be able to support them in the West. Always give honorariums for teachings. Um, don't think, oh, they make their own money, they don't need it. From our side, we should always give an honorarium, a token of thanks. And then it's just according to the means of the centre what you can offer. Offer Sangha lunches so they get to hang out together and, and, and enjoy being monks and nuns together. On uh, first wheel turning day, one of the four auspicious, you know, holy days of the Buddhist calendar, we have an annual Sangha puja and all of the offerings that are made there we, um, we, we put into our Sangha fund. Donate to the IMI. So rather than donate to individual sangha, it's great to donate to the organisation because then they will give where it's most needed. Educate new students on the importance of sangha and on the conduct of showing respect and have a sangha care representative. So someone who can be the intermediary so that if we're too shy, we don't know how to go about something, um, that there is somebody there who, who knows the Sangha position and um, can be our contact. So often the Sangha care representative is someone who's disrobed, who was a monk or a nun, and now they're a lay person. So they have insight into both worlds. And then um, offer the teachings freely. So don't make the Sangha pay for teachings and give them petrol vouchers and help with accommodation and Give them book vouchers for the bookshop, all of those things. So you get the general idea. 
Okay, so now segueing into something entirely other. One of the ways to um, show respect, especially to the lamas, is to offer a carter. And offering a carter, such a nice image, this isn't it? It's um, it's a way of uh, of showing great respect and of generating merit. Often there are the eight auspicious symbols that are on the carter. So I'll show you. I've got one here that's got the symbols printed on it. So it's, usually they're woven in, but they're all white. Um, all the symbols are printed on the carter. And when you offer the carter, especially when you're requesting, uh, especially the lamas, say for an initiation or for refuge vows or to come and have lunch, or if you're giving them a present, it's always nice to, to offer it in the carter. So when you offer the carter, it's folded lengthwise. And so there's an opening all along the long edge. And when you hold the carter, the opening goes towards the llama. So that, uh, my mother used to say, so they can put the blessing inside, <laughs> that, it's, that you're open-minded. But actually what it represents is the closeness of the guru-disciple relationship. So you offer the carter. It's really lovely. And um, it's a beautiful way of offering our, our good heartedness and purity. Often when you do offer the carter, then, then they give it back to you. Like this. You've got to remember to bow your head down so that they can actually put the carter back over your head. Occasionally they won't give the carter back to you and you'll go, oh, give me back my carter. And that is when you're supposed to remember, oh, actually, I've offered the carter, it's not mine. And it's a wake up call to have us stop being materialistic. So don't get attached to, to your carter that's collected so many blessings on it, you know. Uh, so the, the blessing, what is the blessing exactly? Uh, the blessing isn't in the carter. The blessing doesn't come from them putting it over our head. What a blessing is actually is when our mind is moved in a positive direction. Our mind is caused to move in a positive direction. So what happens, how that happens is because we've done so much study, we've done the meditation, we've done all that preparation and groundwork that, that when we see the Lama and we offer the Kata and then put it back over our heads, we're just like spontaneously burst into tears in a washing, you know, that's because we've done all of that groundwork beforehand. Or when you go to puja and you, and you just find yourself crying, <laughs> moved by the puja, that's the blessing. Uh, or when you're reading sutras and, 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 you know, you don't even understand what they're about, but this sense of joy just floods over you, that's the blessing. So when we're requesting our llamas, there's a wonderful picture of llamas Oprimpache here. So you'll see here's the monk's bowl filled with fruit. Uh, so that's like, you know, offering arms, offering food, one of those four requisites representing when we offer, it's to um, representing the, the causes for spiritual nourishment. Then there's the carters draped over the front here of Lama Zoprimbache's throne. So often when, when you offer a, um, a mandala, you, 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 then you drape the carter over the front of the throne. It's like on behalf of everybody. And whenever you're making your offerings, you always hold them in the carter. It's not like with, with empty hands. And just like this little girl is doing, you offer with both hands. Even when you're offering tea or anything like that, you put you have a saucer underneath and you offer with both hands. The, the offering envelopes, whenever you have any of the money, you put it in an envelope so you don't have nude money. <laughs> you wrap it in something so you can't see how much it is. And you don't actually hand that into the hands of the llama. You just put it on the table. So that kind of respects the fact that um, monks and nuns aren't supposed to handle money. In the Tibetan tradition, though, um, because they have to support themselves, um, then it's slightly different from if they're living 
from arms from the community. You'll also see here that there are some white flowers. Um, if you're going to give flowers, uh, the culturally the thing is to not give red and white flowers together. Don't don't combine red and white because that's the symbol of of death of the indestructible drop separating. Um, and you don't give red flowers. So if you've got you know red roses with white baby's breath, then you've got to put in some yellow flowers <laughs> to break up to put in more color. Um, and then, of course, if we're going to request, then uh, if we're going to request refuge, for instance, or to request ordination or to, uh, to request an initiation, then don't go empty handed. Um, bring a small gift, something appropriate, offer it in the carter, do three prostrations. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 please don't. Come and sit down. That's the only time you ignore them. You go, I don't care. I'm doing my three prostrations. <laughs> and the whole time they might be trying to pull you up to not do the prostrations. You go, no, no, I'm doing my three prostrations. If you can't physically do your prostrations, you know, you do your three bows, but you insist on showing that respect. We need the merit. Uh, okay, so... Any questions about just general how to how to request the llamas or that type of offering all clear enough? Yeah, uh, Mary Camille. I'm sorry, I have another question about the kata. Um, I have a Dharma sister who actually is no longer following the Buddhist uh, path. And she gave me a couple of her katas that she has used for years. And I don't know what to do with them, Miffy. Um, just wash them, iron them, you know, hang, hang them out on the line so they're all nice and clean. It's really important to have nice clean carters and then just use them. Yeah, no, no worries. We don't have to get too materialistic about it. I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, spiritual materialism to think, oh, the carters got the blessings. No, no, no. Um, it's, it's the relationship that has the blessings. So don't worry about it. They're just like a wonderful Dharma consumable. <laughs> um, but you can also make prayers too. You can think, you know, if, you, if you're, as you're washing them, you can, you can make some prayers for her that may her, um, her obscurations be removed. May she have a clear path to the Dharma. Okay, so while we're on the topic of llamas and requesting llamas, then what about listening to teaching? So we've requested the teachings, we've requested, you know, Lama Zoroprimbache for, for whatever it is, and here we are, we're at the teachings, and then, oh, my God, how do you listen to the teachings? Because we might sit down and we might just feel like there's a freight train in our head, <laughs> you know, just, or we might sit down and we might feel that it's like we're ice skating over the surface and we can't understand a word. So how to listen to the teachings, how to tune in. Listening especially to highly realised beings like His Holiness, like Lama Um, it's like tuning into a radio. We, we have to adjust our mind. And it takes a little while to adjust our mind. So part of that is why we have all those preliminary prayers because it's, it helps us to focus. It helps us to create the merit. But we have to really calibrate our uh, intention like we're tuning a radio until we can hear. And what we're calibrating is equal parts, very attentive, and relaxed. So we have to put that effort and discipline into focusing our mind and putting aside distractions. But without getting all tight about it, we also have to relax and enjoy it. It's like the most amazing concert in the world that's going to go on forever. 
just like you want them to. So you want to remember to enjoy it. <laughs> so this this quite fine calibre balance. And I found, for instance, with speaking with um, Lama Zoe Primbache, uh, li listening to Lama Zoe Primbache speak, you know, I've been at teachings where I've had good friends on either side of me. One, one lady, my dear friend Cheryl, she's like, What's this guy talking about? It makes no sense. It's just the ramblings of a demented man. This isn't the guy that wrote all those amazing books. There's no way, mutter, 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 on one side. So she, she actually got up and left the teaching. On the other side, I have my dear friend Jordan, and she's listening to these teachings on emptiness, going, oh, wow, this is so exciting. I've never heard anything like it just about jumping out of her skin with excitement that she had to get up and move to the other side of the room because it was too intense sitting next to her. So I ended up at the teachings with no one on either side. <laughs> Two empty seats. So how does this happen? How come people have total different experience of listening to the teachings? So one way is that often the Geshe's when we're listening to the Geshe's, it's like listening to Bach, you know. it's There is a formula. It's beautifully predictable. It's ordered. Um, there are discernible patterns. You have your dot points. You know, Bach's preludes and fugues. I grew up with my mother practising them. Uh, you know, you can, you can it's, it's the harmony of the spheres, you know, it's so organised. And most Geshe's teach like that because it's a monastic study situation. And we may think, ah, when we show up to Lama Zoroprimache's teachings or to a great yogi's teachings, that we're going to get this nice ordered dot points, chapter one, blah, blah, blah. But actually listening to someone like Lama Zoroprimache is like listening to Coltrane. <laughs> you know, it is out there. It's out there in the stratosphere. And if you don't have the background in music, you, you can't even find the tune. You can't find the music. You're just like, what is this? There's nothing to hold on to. So you need the basis of the lamb rim of Bach to be able to listen to Lama Zoroprimache, like Coltrane, to actually relish the riffing on a theme, the different ways of saying this same material that we've just been studying day in, day out. So it's like really, really, really good jazz. <laughs> and, you know, how people hear the Vajra speech is completely different. A Buddha can teach in all languages simultaneously. People hear what they need to hear. So it's important that we ourselves calibrate our listening so that we don't miss out um, and, and really put in effort into that. So um, once you, you, you might find that it takes a little while, it might even take an hour or something to tune in, tune in to Rinpoche. And I remember people saying about how in the first time, and this was before Rinpoche manifested the stroke, when he used to cough a lot, you know, since the stroke, he hasn't done that. Um, and all people could hear was the coughing. It's like all you could hear is the trains going by. And then you get below that, you don't hear the coughing anymore. I never hear it. Now then you're just like, you're in. <laughs> and then it's just like, oh, I could be here forever. It's like on Star Trek, I am travelling through the universe with the Rinpoche forever. But we have to put that initial effort into, into the listening. So basically, listen with your heart, not your ears. Listen with your heart. So we have our preliminary prayers that cleans our heart. That's why they're there. So don't think, oh, it's boring. You know, we're having two hours of prayers when the teaching's going to start. This is because we need a clean. We've got to do the housekeeping first. Have your questions in your mind. Those big questions, what am I doing with my life? You know, whatever your doubts are, your Dharma doubts, whatever difficult situation that you're in, have those questions in your mind. What's the meaning of my life and what can I do with my life? All of those things. So let, as you're sitting there, let all of those big 
themes of your life come to your awareness, the big things, not the little minuscule things like, oh, I didn't get the seat that I wanted or I'm uncomfortable or it's too cold or too hot. Ditch all of those. Now that's the big life and death questions. The ones you need courage for, let them come to your awareness. And as you're listening to the teachings, Apply it to your own life. So help it put your own life into perspective. Don't just think about it as theoretical. And, um, again, what matters most to you will start to come to the surface. So it will be a continuous process as you're listening and um, to make sure that you grow your motivation. You develop your motivation. You start with whatever it is that got you there, but you've got to make it bigger. You've got to make it more altruistic. You've got to make it for every single sentient being. Don't just leave it at, oh, I'm just only human. These are my little human problems. Make it really big. And then you'll get the big, wonderful answers. So listening with your heart, not just your ears, is because... Uh, we're having not just the verbal communication, but there's mental communication. It's an actual thing, mental communication, even on that very coarse level. So what happens is you have like a parallel teaching going on. There's the words of the teaching happening. And then there's also like an inner conversation going on in your mind, um, like on a parallel track where you might have a heart moments and get answers to other things. And that's as legitimate a teaching as the, as the words coming out of the Lama's mouth. That's the mental communication. Yes, they can hear everything that's going on in your mind, but they can anyway. So, you know, no need to be embarrassed, but not only can they hear that then if you are ask those questions in your mind, they will answer them. I mean, it's like, it's just outright clairvoyance happens all the time. So we really have to seize the day for that. And this can this can really help, especially if, um, like there was one few years ago when we had a, uh, a Geshe coming to teach that um, we had a very rocky relationship with, not a, not a very good human to human relationship, lots of difficulties. Um, he had a terrible teaching style and it was almost impossible for people to get through the teaching style. Um, many, many people left. But what happened was, um, despite all of that, I got my best Dharma ideas in his teachings. The inventions that I've done for Lungry Tumba Center, the, the design for the altar, for this and for that, all of it came in those teachings. It was like they were the blessings. Just It just opened up. So on the surface, really difficult. But underneath, this parallel teaching was invaluable. And his analogies were so modern and pertinent. They've, they've stuck with me the whole time. So um, don't just think a teaching is the surface, the nice delivery. You know, that's what television's for. Um, we've got to really listen on that much, much deeper level. Uh, so any questions about this, of listening to the teachings? <laughs> Does it, does it ring any bells? Has anyone else had an experience like that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I friend. Find, I find it very hard to understand Lama Zopa's accent and I struggle. I can listen to every other recorded teaching mm. of everybody else and, you know, Tibetan speaking. And yeah, English, that's right. And that's I I really struggle, yeah. It's because it, you don't, you're going too tight. So mm. when you struggle with an accent, it's because you're not relaxed. Okay. So um, you, you, you're going too tight. It's like when you go into a room and you try and look at everything really intently and you can't actually take in anything. <laughs> We've got to actually relax and let it appear. Yeah. So... You calibrate your mind so you're really alert. You've done all the washing with the prayers and then you relax. And so a way to do that is just go, wow, what a beautiful gompa. Here I am with all my Dharma buddies. What a motley crew we are. Well, that's pretty hysterical. How amazing to be here listening to these teachings and just kind of bliss out for a moment. So 
So you've done the preliminary and then, and then you relax. And then um, have the big questions come up in your heart and then you'll be able to tune in. But we kind of go at it from the outside inwards. It's not going to work that way. Um, and you've got to give it time. Uh, so, you know, at a, at a meditation retreat, it might take a day or two. At a, uh, at a, at a one-night teaching, it might take half an hour. It might take an hour. It's okay. You've got to give it time to run its process. What else? Anything else? Okie oh, dokie. Well, we're almost to the end of this presentation. So how to listen to, to the llamas and how, uh, you know, we have our, our study sessions with our getties and our tutors, and then we have teachings with the, with the great practitioners, and they are something else again. And, um, and you know, even the way Lama Zoprimbache teaches, if you, if you mapped it out like music, uh, you'll see it's like a great, amazing jazz composition. You can map the whole thing out. And right at the end, everything comes back to the resolution. <laughs> like it's all there. It's just that it's so big, we can't hold it in our mind all at once. So is Holiness the Dalai Lama with the, the Geshe Mars. So here are some very special Sangha. So this is from 2016, the first 20 Geshe Mars. So the female Geshe's, um, you know, the, the, the tradition kind of died out for quite a long time. In 2016, this was the, the, the first batch of graduates with the Geshe degree. I think uh, three of them actually came from Copan. Um, His Holiness gave them all a, a carter. So uh, to be a Geshe, you are you, two things. One is you're a fully ordained monk or nun. You, you have to be ordained. And then a Geshe degree is like an educational degree. And it takes between 15 to 25 years. It's huge to actually graduate. You can actually do a similar degree, but if you're not a monk or nun, you're not called a Geshe. Uh, you're called an Acharya. So a, a Geshe is necessarily a monk or a nun as well. So um, they're wearing all of those, all the robes. So I just really rejoice that now we have, you know, this in, in the modern day world, we have this re-establishment of, um, of the, the female Sangha, female tradition as well. So we can end with a dedication with uh, the, an, a really amazing uh, Sangha member, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And, you know, when we ask, from a Buddhist point of view, you know, from, from my point of view as, a, um, as, a, as an aspiring Buddhist practitioner, who is his holiness really? He's actually the embodiment of Guru, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. So his holiness, you know, as a Sangha member, how he says, I'm just a simple monk. Yeah, well, you know, we all know he's not just that but that's what his holiness says. And, and he is a representative of, of the Sangha like that. Uh, but he's a lot more than that. He's, he is uh, a manifestation of the Dharma, of incredible scriptural knowledge, uh, but also walking the talk, living with the realisations. He's a representative of the Buddha, the Buddha's teachings here on earth in the Buddha's footsteps an amazing Renaissance man, just like the Buddha. And he is also the guru deity, the emanation of Chenrezig on earth. So we're so fortunate to have a relative sangha and an ultimate sangha right there in front of us like this. So incredible. So we've looked at a lot today of um, who the sangha are, 
how we can best support the Sangha, what to do when things go wrong, how to not be dismayed or lose our refuge, um, but, you know, use the, the opportunity and, um, and then how to listen to the teachings from our incredible Sangha members, you know, the, 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 the great, great practitioners and teachers. So um, let's dedicate that uh, by our own refuge commitment and showing respect to the Sangha, that, that we may develop that inner Sangha, our, all of our virtues and our qualities, and may we become Sangha for the world. May we become the Sangha jewel so we can perfectly benefit all living beings just like we're benefited now. So uh, we've got one more week to go. Next week we're going to have a look at uh, daily practice and speech blessing. So how to put everything together into a daily practice and um, how to offer our food, how to combine if we've got different types of practices, how to combine them. Hopefully we'll get all of that covered. Uh, uh, but especially introducing you to, to Lama Zora Prinpache's tailor-made prescription for our daily practice. No matter what our other commitments are, he's, he's got this, uh, this prescription, our very basic what we should start with, and one of them is the speech blessing. So we'll go through how to, how to bless our speech because we need that. If we have a family or a job or we speak to people, <laughs> we need to be able to bless our speech so it becomes beneficial. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming along and lots of food for thought, and I hope it was beneficial, and I really hope to see you next week. <laughs>